Hey there, welcome to the Lessons from Lab and Life podcast. I'm your host, Lydia Morrison, and I hope that our podcast offers you some new perspective. Our podcast today focuses on the field of synthetic biology. I'm joined by Tom Knight, who started taking courses at MIT when he was just 14 years old, and later helped design the first bitmap displays, an ITS operating system. Then he decided to apply what he knew about electrical engineering and computer science to biology. He's one of the co-founders of Ginkgo Bioworks, a synthetic biology company in Cambridge, Massachusetts, developing new organisms that replace technology with biology. Today I'm joined by Tom Knight. Thanks so much for joining us today, Tom. Oh, thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure. I read that you have been called the godfather of synthetic biology. Can you tell me how that nickname came to be? Well, by background, I'm a computer scientist and an electrical engineer and uh, spent many, many years at MIT. Uh, Got all of my degrees there. Actually came to MIT as a high school student. I was brought up in Wakefield, Massachusetts. In about 1990 or so, I realized that the next great technology was not going to be based on silicon or uh, electronics, but was instead going to be based on biology and that if I was going to be technologically relevant looking forward, that I had better be part of that. So kind of took a right-hand turn technically at that point and basically became a biology student uh, at MIT. So I took the undergraduate uh, laboratory courses. I sat in on many of the graduate courses in biology, focusing almost entirely on prokaryotic biology. Interesting. And uh, then in about 1996, I approached our funding agencies at uh, DARPA. And DARPA at the time was heavily invested and still is heavily invested in computer science research. Most of our computer science research had been done, sponsored by them. Mm -hmm. Uh, I approached those computer science-oriented people and made the pitch that they should be thinking seriously about biology looking forward. And they run a summer program at the National Academies in Woods Hole. Oh. And that summer program looks at advanced technologies and tries to evaluate which of those technologies the DARPA offices should be funding. Mm -hmm. And I did a study with them in 1996 looking at uh, what at the time we called uh, cellular computing. And uh, the focus was, you know, should we be thinking about a basically an engineering approach to uh, biology? And uh, that's where I think this field really took off because it was really the first time that people had thought about building a, a technology on top of biology something that could do things that you might expect a computer or a other kinds of heavily engineered and technologically oriented devices, how you could make those out of biology. So that really is sort of where things happened. And I think when people look back and they, many of them, I think myself included, uh, you know, view that as really being the place where the technology started. That's really interesting. So that was over 20 years ago. It's really amazing that you were able to make that leap from computer programming and and semiconductor design and think to apply that sort of logic to biological systems. So, I mean, thank you from from the, the scientists, I think, for sort of making that leap to transitioning to a new field. Do you think that you would have been able to come up with an idea like that had you not spent decades learning the ins and outs of computer programming? Probably not. Uh, I think historically, I have I have always been somewhat of a of a you know scientific and engineering generalist. You know, I've always had a variety of interests. Uh, you know, in, in high school, I thought I was going to become an organic chemist. So as I went through the different areas of computing, many of those involved fairly serious transitions 
from programming in Fortran to starting to program in machine language and writing operating systems, and then finally into the areas of computer architecture and designing computers, and then really a, a pretty radical change that started in the, around 1980, moving into the design of integrated circuits and you know the, the silicon technology. All of those involved fairly radical shifts in the kinds of things that I needed to know, and it was very important to have an ability to move quickly from one discipline to another. So this was just the latest one. <laughs> How long did it take you, do you think, to get up to speed in biology? You mentioned you sat in on some undergraduate courses and some graduate courses. So how long does it take to learn to become the master of a new field? My gosh, I, I think I'm still learning. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I don't make any claim to be you know, an expert, although I kind of hold my own sometimes. I'm sure you but, can. But <laughs> uh, I would say in about 1997, as a result of that uh, DARPA uh, summer program, they funded a molecular biology laboratory uh, in the computer science department at MIT. Oh, wow. And so I had the experience of setting up a lab. That was uh, a learning experience, I as bet. they say. <laughs> and so I learned a lot about what it took to actually do these things. Some of my colleagues in the computer science department, I'm sure, thought I was going to kill them, uh, but they seem to have all survived. Well, thank goodness for that. <laughs> <laughs> so about 10 years after that DARPA meeting, um, you founded Ginkgo Bioworks, or co-founded Ginkgo Bioworks. That's right. Can you tell us about what Ginkgo Bioworks does? From the very beginning, I had the privilege of working with four of my co-founders, uh, you know, Reshma Shetty, Austin Chi, Barry Canton, and Jason Kelly. Two of them uh, were my students, uh, PhD students, and two of them were Drew Endy students, who Drew is now at Stanford. We worked very closely together in the early 2000s, and when they were all graduating uh, roughly at the same time, completely at the same time, uh, in 2008, Jason approached me and said, uh, you know, well, uh, what would you think if we just started a company uh, rather than going to try to find a, an academic position or, or a lab somewhere to do a postdoc? And I said, that sounds great. Can I join you? <laughs> <laughs> because frankly, at that point, I was uh, pretty fed up with the academic world. It had become increasingly difficult to get funding for the proposals that I wrote. Mm -hmm. I wrote what I thought were extremely good proposals, and the funding people in many cases told me that they really liked these proposals, but at the end of the day, uh, there was not money coming in the door. Do you think they were sort of just a bit too forward-thinking and far-reaching for the types of funding that were available? Possibly. <laughs> That's been a problem of mine for, for many years. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness for that. <laughs> but in any case, the goal of, uh, of Ginkgo was, and really still to this day, is best exemplified by the mission statement of the company, which is to make biology easier to engineer. Mm. That fundamentally is what guides us. It's uh, what we think about on a day-to-day -day basis. And how we go about doing that and the methods and approaches that we take, those all change. But that fundamental direction has never really changed. So we're focused, you know, laser-like on can we move biology from being a scientific discipline to being a high-throughput technology something that you can build upon a foundry-based approach to biology, much in the same way that the semiconductor world has developed semiconductor foundries where you have a variety of different companies, some of them who have no access whatsoever to semiconductor fabrication, mm. are doing designs of uh, you know of semiconductor components, mm -hmm. but then they are fabricated in a central facility. Okay. We had much that vision for Ginkgo. We wanted to build a, a technology which allows a variety of different projects, a variety of different customers to come together to share a centralized facility that 
is able to do extremely effective engineering of biological systems. And that's, that's what we've tried to create. That's really interesting. I'm sure there are proprietary restrictions, but can you tell us about any of the interesting ongoing projects that you're working on? Well, there's a couple that I think you know might be easy to talk about. Mm-hmm. Uh, one particularly interesting one that attracts my attention, you know, we made early efforts uh, to go into the flavors and fragrance area. And so we have, uh, you know, developed uh, close relationships with some of the perfume manufacturers and are doing a number of projects for them. Uh, I really can't talk about those projects, (laughs) but we are doing a a fascinating project uh, in collaboration with the Harvard Herbarium. The Harvard Herbarium uh, over the past 200 years or so has collected samples of flowers from all around the world. Some of those flowers that they have collected are now extinct. Oh, wow. So we have a collaboration with with the Harvard Herbarium where we can get access to dried samples of flowers. Uh, We can sequence the DNA from those extinct flowers. And then uh, using our high-throughput DNA synthesis, we can uh, make the genes that are pulled out from those extinct flowers and uh, recreate some of the uh, enzymes that might be found in those flowers. You can't, of course, know that the compounds that you're making are ones that that were really made by those flowers, but uh, you can make a pretty good guess that the compounds, the scents that are being produced by those terpene uh, synthase molecules are in fact uh, you know, representative, at least in a crude way, of some of the scents that those flowers might have produced. That's so interesting to think that you could smell the scent of an extinct flower. What an interesting way to preserve and to add to that catalog of flowers. Another project that has been widely announced is our recent collaboration with uh, Bayer Crop Sciences. where Bayer, the large chemical manufacturer, Mm -hmm. uh, has for many years had a presence in the agricultural business. Mm -hmm. We were chosen by Bayer to set up a joint venture between Ginkgo and Bayer to make it possible to develop a uh, a nitrogen-fixing bacterium that they could apply to uh, seeds in the field. And uh, the idea would be that uh, you could take crops like corn and wheat that naturally do not produce their own nitrogen to the extent that soybeans and peanuts do, for example. Mm. You could take uh, take bacteria that are able to fix nitrogen from the air and uh, replace some of the chemical fertilizer in the field for these uh, very common crops with microbes rather than uh, chemical fertilizers. Interesting. So that would aid in fertilization and growth? Would remove the need to do at least as much of the chemical fertilization, which has a whole set of environmentally dangerous aspects of you know, runoff of, of nitrogen fertilizers into uh, water supplies and, and so forth. Also, of course, has a cost impact. So these would be natural production through microbes of nitrogen. Yes, but engineered microbes. Right. Not, not naturally natural, occurring microbes. Not natural microbes. That's so interesting. When will we expect to see those crops in the well, field? Well, it's, it's what we call, sometimes call a moonshot project. Mm. It's uh, you know, recognized, I think, by everyone to be rather difficult. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a five-year program. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I think that you know, there's no reason to expect that it's going to be next year. <laughs> That's so exciting, though, and really nice to hear that efforts in biological engineering are geared towards reducing environmental impact of agriculture. Yes. Could you tell me how recent advances in technology and the introduction of robotics has um, moved forward your workload or your pipeline? A typical project that we engage in involves assembling pathways of several enzymes to produce final products. The approach that we're taking is as a result of the high throughput uh, you know, screening that we have, you know, uses uh, you know, some rather different ways of approaching that process. Mm-hmm. A typical pathway that, that we design 
looks at each of the enzymes in that pathway uh, independently. And typically when we start the project, we know a, at least one enzyme that is capable of catalyzing a specific step in that pathway. The approach that we take is to use the amino acid sequence for that protein and uh, search our databases, both the publicly available databases and also our proprietary internal databases, and pull out hundreds of thousands of amino acid sequences that are similar to the enzyme that we start with. Uh, we may also pull out enzymes that are predicted to do similar reactions, but which are uh, not particularly related at a sequence level with mm. the enzymes that we start with. We then construct a phylogenetic tree of those uh, enzymes, and it's typical to see that a large fraction of them are very, very similar. They may come all from sequencing E. coli, for example. We choose uh, representative samples sparsely from that list and pull out perhaps a thousand versions of amino acid sequences that we think are worth testing. Mm. Those amino acid sequences are then recoded uh, into DNA sequences for the specific organisms that we're planning on using and are uh, handed over to our synthesis team. That synthesis team will then take those uh, sequences, uh, you know, use high throughput techniques to synthesize all of those fragments and then our transformation team will uh, insert those sequences into the target organism, will grow the organisms up, and will test the effectiveness of those enzymes. That's done, again, in high throughput by our test team. Our test team uh, typically would lyse those uh, organisms and provide the substrate for those enzymes and you know, look for the desired products. They may for example, be looking at not just the activity of those enzymes, but also the specificity of those enzymes. It may be that you want one of the products of those enzymes, but not another. Only at the end of that process do we select a specific uh, amino acid sequence for the enzyme that we care about. Mm -hmm. uh, we will then assemble that step of the pathway together with all of the other steps of the pathway for making the product we care about. And then at that point, we hand that over to our high-throughput fermentation team, whose job it is then to scale that pathway and that organism up for uh, large-scale industrial production. So at each step, there is application of robotic technology all the way from building the pieces of DNA through the transformation, through the lysis of those, to the screening with things like LCMS uh, analysis of products, all the way through the robotics that's used for the fermentation scale-up. So how long does it take between that selection of the 1,000 engineered enzymes that you're going to start to screen to a final choice of what you will then scale up to be of the final product? The DNA assembly step takes probably four weeks, and the high throughput test is probably another four weeks. After that, a typical result of spending that time doing that testing will result in enzymes that are, I would say, on average, probably about 10 times better than the ones you started with. So this is a very worthwhile set of high-throughput experiments that really results in a significant improvement in the final pathway design. Yeah, and it seems a very expedited process. You're talking about, you know, maybe a little over two months for a 10x improvement on an existing pathway. Yes. Now, of course, what I didn't talk about is, you know, there's time at the beginning Absolutely. trying to figure out what your pathway should be and choosing those sequences. And there's time, at, a lot of time typically at the end involving, you know, scale up for fermentation. And also uh, we've discovered if you're doing a commercial chemical product, there's, you know, typically a, a large amount of resources and time spent in downstream purification of, of those final products. Absolutely. You mentioned that in the thinking before you begin the process of screening, say, those 1,000 compounds, 
uh, you're doing a lot of data mining. So I wanted to get your thought on the future of predictive biology and how those data sets are really going to play into changes that we see in biological research really within the next decade or two. Yeah. If you compare what we are currently doing in biology with other high technology disciplines, a good comparison would be the you know, semiconductor industry. It's worthwhile thinking about how a company like Intel goes about producing their next generation microprocessor chip. Mm. What that process looks like is that their marketing team sets up a set of goals for their next processor. They assemble a team that might start out being as small as 10 or 20 people. And that team would start engineering the architecture of that microprocessor. That team would grow probably to perhaps a thousand people wow. in uh, over the next two years. Wow. Those people would be involved in a very detailed design of that microprocessor, heavily, heavily relying on computer simulation mm. to get every aspect of that processor correct. At the end of that two or maybe three year period, that team shrinks again, probably to like 50 people. And at the end of that process, uh, they take the design of that processor, which is now thoroughly simulated, and they make it. And at the end of that fabrication process, uh, they power it up. And unless they've really made serious mistakes, it works the first time. Now. And there's no We're, version two? There's, well, yeah, there might be, you know, version 1.01. Oh, okay, okay. There might be some <laughs> slight tweak that they have to make to make it perfect. Mm -hmm. But basically, there is no version two. We are very far away from doing that in biology. Okay. And the question is, you know, how do we transition from a technology of the kind that we have today where we really are heavily reliant on experimentation. I hesitate to say it's blind because it really isn't blind, but it, you know, it's not driven by you know, simulation and a detailed understanding of what's going on, but driven by a over-reliance, in my view, on, on experimentation. So how do we transition from where we are today to uh, a predictive version of biology. Yeah. And do we have the data sets in place to no, be able to do no, that? Absolutely, we do not. And that really is, has been the major issue in trying to move forward in the field. It isn't just the data sets. It's actually, in many cases, a lack of knowledge about what's actually going on. I remember fondly some of my colleagues in the biology department uh, at MIT, I would talk to them about, uh, you know, wanting to engineer biology. And they would say, well, uh, you know, some of them would say, Tom, why are you working in E. coli? Uh, we already know everything there is to know about it. What could you possibly learn? <laughs> and there were a lot of things that I didn't understand about how E. coli worked. And so I thought, ah, ah this is my opportunity. I will, I will find out. <laughs> And, uh, and what did you learn about E. coli? <laughs> I, learned out, I learned that they don't understand how it works either. Mm. And that was kind of my takeaway uh, from those discussions, which is that the scientific biology community, and of course this is a gross oversimplification and perhaps even uh, misrepresentation, but many of them think that these simple, relatively simple bacterial organisms are already so well understood that we have nothing left to learn from them. Mm. And that's absolutely not the case. We have huge gaping holes in our ability to think about what's going on in these organisms. And the only way of filling those holes is by measuring much, much more than we ever have before about what's going on inside those organisms. One of the great resources that we have available at Ginkgo is that we are able to do very high throughput measurements of a lot of these biological systems. 
And so my hope is that, you know, as we move forward over the next five or ten years, we will be able to apply some of those measurement technologies to build up the kind of data set that's necessary to really start simulating these systems rather than trying to just blindly engineer them. So that's a goal. It's so wonderful to know, I think, that there is such a forward-thinking company that's really working towards building these data sets. At NEB, we've been thinking a lot about artificial intelligence and machine learning and predictive biology. We've had some very interesting speakers from Google and other experts in the machine learning field. And it does seem like the data to drive these decisions is really where we're lacking in the biological field right now. So it's so wonderful to know that there's a company out there working so (laughs) hard to really build this resource that's going to benefit the world. So thank you for everything that you do. (laughs) Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks so much for being here today. It was such an honor to be able to interview you. I hope that you'll be enjoying the rest of your visit here today. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us for this episode of our podcast. As always, check out the transcript of this podcast for links to further resources. And join us next episode for a discussion of the history of molecular cloning and speculations on where it's headed in the future with New England Biolab senior scientist, Bill Jack.